New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. What if you were a Midwestern haberdasher who became a U.S. senator, and then you served just three months as vice president before finding yourself thrust into the big chair, charged with winning the Second World War? We'll meet that man next. It is with a heavy heart that I stand before you, my friends and colleagues in the Congress of the United States. Tragic fate has thrust upon us grave responsibilities. We must carry on. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. And a special tip of the hat to everybody enjoying today's time travel adventure via our YouTube channel. You can find me at historyauthor.com or across social media platforms. Plus, you can read my columns in the New York Sun to get my analysis of current events through the lens of what I've learned from all these history books behind me. Certainly, today's episode is one that I will be going back to and looking for quotations for my columns because Harry S. Truman is just so quotable. Our time machine travels back to 1945 to meet him and see him as we've never seen him before, when the weight of the world, a world war, fell on his shoulders, the shoulders of an unlikely leader who never sought the job. Our guide on this journey is journalist Jeffrey Frank. He brings us the trials of Harry S. Truman, the extraordinary presidency of an ordinary man, 1945 to 1953. Jeffrey Frank is the best-selling author of Ike and Dick, Portrait of a Strange Political Marriage. He's also published four novels, among them the Washington Trilogy. Those are The Columnist, Bad Publicity, and Trudy Hopedale. He's also co-author with Diana Crone Frank of a new translation of Hans Christian Andersen stories, which won the 2014 Hans Christian Andersen Prize. Mr. Frank was a senior editor at The New Yorker, the deputy editor of the Washington Post's Outlook section, and is now a contributor to major publications nationwide. You can visit him at jeffreyfrank.com or on Facebook and at Jeffrey A. Frank on Twitter. Okay, now that we've heard the news that Franklin Delano Roosevelt has passed away after an unprecedented 12 years in the White House, let's meet the man facing the difficult task of taking up his mantle and dig into the trials of Harry S. Truman. And here we are with Jeffrey Frank. He's joining us to chat about his new book, The Trials of Harry S. Truman, The Extraordinary Presidency of an Ordinary Man, 1945 to 1953. Thank you for making time to chat with the History Author Show, sir. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, I'm fascinated by Truman, which probably stands me in good stead, and that's very good for your book because you look at the things he packed into that presidency or the things that were packed into him, it for him from outside forces. And it's just fascinating. I want to start where the Truman presidency does because he's thrust into things. It's not just a president that accomplishes a lot in those years from 45 to 53, but somebody who's acted upon by outside forces literally from the minute he is thrust into that job. Yeah. So I'll ask you to start there. It's the day that he learns of Franklin Roosevelt's death. And he tells reporters in this very human moment, Boys, if you ever pray, pray for me now. What does that moment tell readers about the ordinary man, to quote your subheadline, that they meet here in the trials of Harry S. Truman? Well, he was he was he was he was, he was frightened. He was frightened. He had um, and he he might have been anticipating this because everyone he knew that Roosevelt wasn't 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 doing all that well. He'd had they, he'd had one meal with him the previous August. They, they didn't, they hardly knew each other. And he noticed that Roosevelt's hand was shaking um, and he looked very pale and people, people, people thought he was in really bad shape, but he didn't think this was gonna happen, ha happen right away. And he was, um, so he was, he, he was a frightened, frightened man at the same time he had done, he'd been, an, he'd been a vice president for three months and he'd been doing nothing but going to parties and being and having a great old time 
he would he would go to parties. He would he would he would have bourbon and branch water in the afternoon with his friends from Congress. He never really had quite left Congress. And Roosevelt, meanwhile, was out of town. Roosevelt had gone had 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 had, had, had gone to uh, to 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 uh, talk to to Stalin and and and, and Churchill in 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 and in, in Yalta. And uh, so the, the the world was going on without Truman. And so he suddenly suddenly yeah here he was. He was frightened. He had no he had, he had two wars going on. He hadn't even been told about this new thing called an atomic bomb, and and so it was it was a very very uh, uh, scary moment for him, and, and uh, suddenly to be president of the United States, and not only that, the United States had become undoubtedly the, the leader of, of the, the, the single superpower. It's so so it was, it was an extraordinary responsibility that uh, like like no other president had ever faced. Even if you think of it today, I, I don't know if anybody else ever could face such a moment because. The nuclear bomb is so new. I think today, if any of us were dropped in, so to speak, we would we would know a little bit, at least, even as civilians, the power of the bomb, the damage it would do, the, the danger of it, the horrors. He doesn't even know that. And here he is, this kid from Missouri who yeah. finds himself there. It, it's just fascinating, that, that ordinary part I keep coming back to. And yeah. he, he's stuck in the vice presidency. It reminds me of Theodore Roosevelt, very, very similar he wonders, why did I take this job? There's nothing to do. Maybe I'll go back to law school. And then the president dies and he's elevated. Six presidents before FDR have died in office. And Truman Truman studied the past, which is fascinating about him. It shows maybe a little bit, I would say, of his, his insecurity, his dedication to the job, his interest in getting it right, that he looked back at his, at his predecessors. How did he apply the lessons he learned so that he succeeded, like uh, Fillmore and Arthur, Theodore Roosevelt, Coolidge, they, they do pretty well. And they don't fa he doesn't fail like a John Tyler or an Andrew Johnson, that he takes that mantle, gets a deep breath, asks for those prayers, and then goes to the job. What did he learn from the past? Well, don't forget, he wasn't entirely a kid from Missouri. He'd had a, he, he, in his, in his first term Good as a boy. senator, he was, the second term, he actually would, he actually had accomplished something. He'd become the leader, the, the, the chairman of this, what was called the Truman Committee, which really looked into, uh, by modern language, West, waste, fraud, and abuse in the defense industry. And this was before the war. It went on during the war. And he saved the nation millions of dollars. And so he was, so he was a, a naive, but he really, but he was totally out of sort of, sort of international politics. He didn't know. Uh, he may have met Churchill once during a visit to Washington. He knew no one, and he was, it was, it, it was all new. So I don't know that I don't know that he studied these predecessors either, because there was nothing. There was nothing. There was no real precedent for this. Um, I mean, when 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 uh, Warren G. Harding died of died of what it was food poisoning, and and Calvin Coolidge took over, it wasn't such a big deal. I mean, Coolidge had this job, and and he, he, there wasn't that much to do. The country was doing pretty well. And, uh, and 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 uh, you know this this the this the sort of Great Depression didn't didn't happen for several years. So he so it, it was a very different time. There weren't two wars going on. Yeah, and, and so yeah. to Andrew Johnson, who who did not who did not have a good presidency. There was a war going on then when Lincoln was killed, but that was there's nothing 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 like this. Yeah, toward, towards the towards the very end, right? And for me, yeah, I, yeah. I visited his birthplace and his museum there in yeah. Independence, Missouri. And I, I guess I maybe I'm projecting putting myself in his shoes and thinking you're remembering that you're a kid from a farm or thinking of that statue that's uh, of Eisenhower as a young man that's in Abilene. And it says, proudest thing I could say is that I'm I'm uh, raised in Abilene or that I was raised in Abilene. So, to me, I. Uh, this is your joy as a biographer. You can look back at the full picture of this man's presidency. And I know that he did look back at some of those predecessors. I guess maybe that was later in his in his presidency and said what he thought of each one of them and that they're non-entities and he he critiqued them. He is yeah. like like William McKinley, one of only two 20th century presidents that didn't graduate college. And I think today yeah. that's still something people would feel a little insecure about. So how did those humble upbringings, how did his going off to ser serve in the Great War, how did his not going to college and maybe feeling a little bit like he didn't fit in with these stuffed shirts, how did that shape the way that this man we meet in the trials of Harry S. Truman approached his job for those almost eight years? Yeah, I, I think definitely all, all of that, certainly the, certainly his service in the in the Great War and the First World War was enormously important to him. He had never, 
he had never commanded men before. He had never, and he and and he was um, he and he never really been away from away from home. And he was a uh, and furthermore, he was a, he was Missouri Baptist. Suddenly, he was he was with 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 poor eyesight commanding these Irish Catholics from Kansas City. It worked. They liked him. He found that he had this this talent, and that gave him an enormous amount of of, of self confidence, which he which which he never had before. And that was very important. As far as not going to college, I'm not sure that it really weighed on him it, um, he he was a big reader he didn't always understand or he didn't, he didn't always interpret history as way others did but he was you have to remember that was in, in those days uh, going to college was not was not the most in, important thing james francis burns who was a fascinating character who became truman's first secretary of state um he was and he was roosevelt's basically second in command roosevelt named him um named him to be the sort of the, the, the sort of czar for all domestic things during the war before that roosevelt had appointed him to the supreme court james francis burns never finished high school james francis burns basically <laughs> wow. Well, basically had a correspondence course. He learned how to type. He became a court stenographer, became a lawyer, ran for Congress, then ran for the Senate. And, and he was on the Supreme Court. He was so bored by the court that he left. But nevertheless, so going to college was not was not the most important thing in, 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 in the 40s. And it, it meant something. And also, I think, but I think what was different was that Truman had a very, it was a different, very different cultural background. He came from the Midwest. The, all these Easterners with Roosevelt, were, there was a whole different crowd. The, these, all these, all these Ivy Leaguers had gone to Groton and Harvard and Yale. Truman and Truman didn't. Truman went to Independence High School, and that was it. But, but I don't think. But, but it was so. So there was definitely a major cultural shift in the cabinet after Truman came in. They, everyone, basically, everyone was gone very quickly, except for James Forrestal, the Secretary of the Navy, who had a very, uh, as I, as I wrote in the book, a very sort of troubled and. And, and, and sad career once uh, as the last cabinet officer, not because he was the last cabinet officer from Roosevelt's era, but because, because there was all sorts of other personal problems. But, um, but yeah, no, Truman, that was not, a, that was not Truman's, Truman's big, big, um, big, big, big issue, I don't think. This is what a great book and a great biography, which this is, does, and it's, it makes you think of all of these different things. And for me now, as you're speaking about Truman in college, I, I'm saying to myself, Compare him to Andrew Johnson, who comes in with this chip on his shoulder, grows up illiterate, is always thinking people are looking down on him for his lack of education, snickering about him behind his back, goes out to settle scores. And from from what you're telling me here in the trials of Harry S. Truman, he's he's putting those kinds of things aside. It doesn't seem like that those petty concerns or that insecurity really affects him here. And that makes him a more effective leader than someone like Johnson, who flames out so spectacularly. Yeah, I think he was. I think he was affected by the sort of people who made fun of him, who made fun of him as a the way the way he dressed and his midwesternness and so on, and and looked down on him. But but it was but it was a sort of cultural snobbery. It wasn't. I mean, I think don't forget Andrew Johnson, Abe, Abe Lincoln had the same sort of uh, people looked, had the same sort of problem. But he, it didn't it didn't seem yeah. to bother him enormously. So and you mentioned and, his Truman, vision too. Yeah. Oh, good, yeah. please. Oh, no, no, I was saying Truman was fascinated by that period, by the Civil War period. It was, uh, yeah, and he, he mentioned his vision and where I grew up in Crestville, New Jersey. There was one of the last barracks. They just knocked it down recently from the Great War because they had Camp Merritt there. And there was this picture of Truman there on the wall that over the years, probably nobody but the old timers even recognized that it was him, even old timers, because he looked so young. And that's yeah. a fascinating period. And I often think of that arc here. How does how does he apply some of those lessons here to his presidency that he learned from going over there? The Great War, World War I, as it becomes known, was such a prelude, and they try to apply those lessons. How did he apply that trench eye view, that, that common soldier view, to closing out the Second World War when he finds himself thrust into that position? Yeah, I don't, I'm not. I mean, I'm not sure that he's. That I, I think what it did is it gave him confidence and it gave him a sense of what war is like. No other. I mean, he he was the only president of that period who actually had actually seen combat. Um, I mean, Franklin Roosevelt was the assistant secretary of the navy, I, I, and when Truman was was over there, and um, so that was something. But it, so it, it gave him a real sense of of what war is like. I'm not sure that. I mean, it was a whole different. I mean, a whole different thing. I mean, Roosevelt Roosevelt had basically ended. Uh, ended the, the the war in, in Europe was basically over when when Truman when 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 uh, when, when he was when he died, and I'm not sure that and, and I think Truman just saw this 
you know, Truman saw these great generals, Eisenhower and and Patton and so on, and they were they were cleaning the place up and um, and, and and in the Pacific too. So I don't think that World War One experience what it did was it gave him confidence. It gave him confidence that he could actually make make decisions about war and peace. And I think that maybe someone who had never seen war might have might have, might have been less sure of himself. And Truman really was fairly sure of himself, maybe too much so at times. But yeah. Well, that leads to my next question here about the trials of Harry S. Truman, and that's yeah. No presidential bi biography is complete without examining the relationship with the press. And that's often how we first remember them, that first draft of history. And I found this interesting that he had these unforced errors, I guess you could call them, and that he has to deal with them. And he, uh, another thing to go back to the Midwest, he has maybe the, some of that bluntness that today we just love to read about. But at the time, that can make it tough dealing with the press and getting your message out clearly. What will readers learn about the 33rd president and how he handled the media from reading your book? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, by the way, I'm very that interested me a lot. I mean, as someone who was who was who was worked as a journalist, um, I, I found that fascinating. Truman actually had a sort of a bifurcated view of the press. He he liked reporters. See, they, they were from they were the same background as, as Truman. They were they were not Ivy Leaguers mostly. They were working work, working men and women, but mostly men. It was a different era, but the, but he did not. He, but the, the, it was the columnists who drove him crazy, the the Walter Lippmans who uh, the Walter Lippmans, the, the, the Joseph Alse, Joseph and Stuart Alsop, who were very powerful columnists. He called them the Sop Sisters, and uh, and and they drove him crazy um, because they they really looked down on him and they and and and, and treated him as basically an, an amateur. But the but the working press, <clears throat> he was. I'm sorry. He was he was pretty comfortable with because they were they were like him, and they had a, it was a different system too. With in those days, the press conferences were not they were on the record, but they weren't. Everything everything had to be cleared through his his press secretary. He would say something, and then they would go to Charlie Ross, who was his press secretary. Can, can we use that? And usually they would say yeah, but sometimes Truman said no, and we and he would be careful. He was it was always a matter of indirect quotation, so he was treated pretty. He could have some control over what he was quoted as saying. He would give a he would give a rare face-to-face -face interview with someone like Arthur Kroc, who was the Washington bureau chief of the New York Times. And then Kroc would, would have would have a big story, but he would never quote Truman directly. He would always be it would always be this indirect quotation. So he was protected in that sense. But then once in a while he would say he would have blurted out something, and yeah, he would get in trouble. He was like during the Korean War. He suddenly he suddenly let open the possibility that he might use an atomic bomb, and then they walked that back for uh, for several days. It was but it was it was so such an alarming statement that the that that Clement Attlee, who was then the, the the prime minister, flew over to, to sort of talk to him and say, "Wait, wait, 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 wait what? Let's 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 take it easy here." And uh, so 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 that was uh, so so he would sometimes let things out, but usually usually he was protected by the by the rules by the rules of engagement with the press. Must have been, must be something that presidents today are very jealous of. When I read that he mentioned Joseph McCarthy in some of those <laughs> for press conferences, and he goes and says, "Oh yeah, take that, take that name out." Like, well, good yeah, luck was, getting a, a press to do that was, today. Exactly, what a luxury! So at the same time, you realize yes. he basically had a press conference every week. He and Eisenhower did pretty much the same thing. They got up there every week and answered questions. Eisenhower also was had. Had, would occasionally have had, had actually a televised press conference. He was the first one to, to do that. Can you imagine that today, a press conference every week? <laughs> it's yeah. a, such a strange idea. I guess Jack <laughs> Kennedy came close, but not even but not even Jack Kennedy did, did that often. Different time. Very different uh, time. You mentioned the United Kingdom and, the, and that special relationship that, that comes into being and the Iron Curtain speech by Winston Churchill. That That's a big iconic moment. And I think sometimes we distill it down to, hey, it gave us this really cool name for the Eastern Bloc and, and this great visuals that Churchill was so well known for. But I learned from the trials of Harry S. Truman that during his presidency, the way he handles it is a way that maybe is still a little bit of learning on the job or maybe an unforced error. So I'd like you to explain that because when we hear about that speech, we just think of, oh, it was it was real flowery and it was great and there couldn't possibly be any any downside to it. You would just applaud and keep your mouth shut. But Truman doesn't that, do that. That's exactly what, actually, that's something I learned too. I was, oh, well, this, this was Truman's great Iron Curtain speech. And it turns out that, I mean, yes, he, he, he did give this speech. Truman was, um, uh, I mean, Churchill was, 
visiting the United States then. He had, he'd come over in January of 46. He had nothing to do. He was out of office. He, he, he'd, he'd been voted out of office in the, the, the previous July during the Potsdam conference while he was meeting, while Churchill and Stalin and Truman were meeting at Potsdam. Right in, toward the end of the conference, Churchill was out of there. So he was replaced by Clement Attlee, the, 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 labor, the labor candidate. So he had nothing to do. He, he came over. And, and so what are you going to do with him? And there was, so there was an idea that he might give this speech. And, um, and then the, the, the venue was Westminster College in, in, in Fulton, Missouri, which is the, the alma mater of, of uh, Harry Vaughan, who was Truman's uh, b- buddy and crony and, and, and close aide. And, and Truman, um, so great. They, they, they took a train out to Missouri. They played poker. Uh, had, a, had sort of a great old time. Truman claimed he had no idea what Truman, what Churchill was going to say. That's not really true. There, 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 there's, there's lots of evidence to suggest that Truman did know. And then Churchill, yeah, the speech was was quite amazing. It was pure Churchill. There was, it was, yeah, flowery wasn't the word for it. He would say things: the awful ruin of Europe with all its vanished glories, and large parts of Asia stare us with eyes when the designs of wicked men with aggressive urge of mighty states dissolve even larger areas, the frame of civilized society, humble folk are confronted with difficulties, they cannot cope. All is distorted, all is broken, all is ground to pulp. And then when he came to the Iron Curtain part, he spoke an Iron Curtain just descended across Europe. This was the, the phrase which probably he had used before. And he said, he, then he started saying, oh, behind that line, all the capitals of the ancient states of Central Europe, all are subject to a very high, and in some cases, increasing measure of control from Moscow. And this really, this this was not wildly applauded in Washington. Some one of Roosevelt's son, James Roosevelt, thought it was like a, it, it was it was really a, aggressive. And then, but then Stalin himself read the speech. Truman was next to Churchill, applauding with everyone else when this was still going on. And Stalin gave an interview to Pravda pretty soon. And said, he said, "This is a call to war." This is the sort of thing we actually hear a little bit. It reminds me a little bit when Truman, when Harry, when, when Joe Biden says. Presumably that, that suddenly that well um, I don't think that Putin can remain in office that wasn't quite like that but it was a provocative thing going on and Truman finally Truman got the word this you cool you have to cool it he sent he wanted to send word to Stalin I'll do the same for you you can come over or you can come over you can give a speech and I'll introduce you and and all of that and that's that and that speech that that note was delivered to Stalin but it was it was it, it, he was criticized by members of Congress and and others and for for, for being unnecessarily provocative and for and for taking sides in an issue where he shouldn't. Rose, Stalin was still our wartime ally. The war was hadn't been over for more than a few months, and so Truman Truman had really um, so yes, it was an unforced error in, in many ways. And but it, but it did leave a great speech, behind, or at least a memorable speech and a memorable phrase, and that lasted. Truman was sort of in awe of Churchill as. Many were. Churchill was over here. He he wore his costume, the Hamburg hat, the cigar, the V the, the V for victory sign. So so and that 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 image and lingered long after the war. I like that moment of transition from his predecessor, FDR, who treats Stalin very affectionately, cuddly Uncle Joe in this image, because there's there's a war on to win. And this is the transition that begins to the Cold War. And there there's so many phrases and, and time periods and lines and uh, and moments we remember still today. And you're, you're amazed that it's all crammed into one man's presidency, the Marshall Plan, the Berlin Airlift, the NATO, founding of NATO, the, uh, the integration of the U.S. military, the, the Korean War, which we, have, we haven't even mentioned yet, which seems incredible. There's so much that happens in this presidency that I, I really have to compliment you and ask you, how do you, how do you distill it down? Were there, were there things that happened here, such as the assassination attempt on him, that, that yeah, you really wish you could have dug into more? That could be a whole book. Yeah, I mean, I was, it's, I mean, as, as a writer, that was, that was my big challenge. Often things would happen simultaneously. So how do I do that without making, making it a narrative jumble? And you, you, you find a way around it by just going back. I mean, I, I do make it chronological and I do tell, the, I try to, and I do tell the story as it happens. But, but yeah, that was this, there was a lot, the, the assassination attempt happened while the Korean War was going on. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the Korean War happened while, while, while his actually, while lots of personal things were happening too, his his dear friend and his press secretary Charlie Ross suddenly died at his desk during the Korean War. Um, all these things were going. The, the, and the Korean War itself 
was 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 a, was a actually we realize now it was a it was an extraordinary event which was still being studied. We still don't quite know all that went on behind the scenes before the war broke out. I just I was fascinated. I became fascinated by the Korean War. I should I've got to sort of got to describe. I, I I realized that I couldn't write about. It. I had to go to Korea. It's not like I must I must go to Korea, but I did have to go to Korea just to sort of even even. Even seeing the place from the air, you say, "Oh my God!" You can see how could you fight a war in this place? Mountains and ridges, and and in this place, this place is this that place the size of this, 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 I mean, it's the size of New Jersey or something. And 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 um, thirty-seven thousand Americans died in the Korean War. I mean, that that's is extraordinary. Oh, probably a million Chinese, hundreds of thousands of North of South Koreans died, and then and then the Korea itself was basically obliterated. Uh, or North Korea was village by village, town by town, because MacArthur had ordered General Stratmeyer to burn it all, burn it all. It, it became a, became a really nasty, nasty war. We used napalm for the first time in Korea, and uh, so and before it was all over, uh, it was a, it was a stalemate. The, the Korea, the North Koreans came in a little bit ahead. They got one city changed sides, but otherwise it went back to it. And the war is still on. I mean, we never it was, it was never a peace yeah. treaty. There was a there was a ceasefire. So, uh, so that was it. That was it. Was quite, quite something that war, and 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 we're still dealing with it, and we're still feeling the effects of it. Um, uh, Kim Jong Un, the 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 uh, the uh, great leader of North Korea, he's the grandson of the man who was the great leader when the war broke out, and who and who and who must have hated us for what happened to his country. You're enjoying my conversation with Jeffrey Frank. He's the author of The Trials of Harry S. Truman, The Extraordinary Presidency of an Ordinary Man, 1945 to 1953. Please visit our guest at jeffreyfrank.com or find him on Facebook and at Jeffrey A. Frank on Twitter. Richard Lawrence Miller, author of Truman, The Rise to Power, and Lincoln and His World, writes of the trials of Harry S. Truman, Frank's talent as a novelist is on display here. With his refreshing and much-needed re-examination of Truman's life, Frank establishes himself as a source of value to any reader interested in mid 20th century America. I like to interview novelists. That's why I chose that very favorable review of your book because you, you bring the talents of a storyteller to nonfiction and that's something that makes it much more interesting. Sometimes people see a book and they think, well, that's going to be a lot of facts and dates. It won't be exciting and interesting. I can assure all of you, dear listeners, that is not the case. It's enjoyable because you have that sense of narrative. You have that sense of telling a story. You get a fascinating character here that in some way his presidency is stranger than fiction in Harry S. Truman. So how did you apply those novelist skills that Richard Lawrence Miller praised to present the 33rd president's story in the trials of Harry S. Truman in, the, in a way that does indeed deliver your readers a fresh re-examining of his life, but that's also interesting and that you could pick it up and you could read it at a beach. And I don't, I don't mean that in any way disparaging. It's interesting. And it, it holds your interest throughout the whole book. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. I think, I mean, I, 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 one thing I should tell you, yes, I, I, I guess what, whatever talents I have as a novelist probably came into this in the sense that I, I have a pretty good sense of, of story, of, of telling a story of, of, of narrative and so on. But I also, you, you have to do this. You, can, you can't cheat. And by cheating, I mean, you don't recreate conversations. You don't recreate anything. Every single line in that book is that, that is footnoted. It's footnoted from diaries, from letters, from, from people, 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 oral histories and so on. So there's no cheating going on. It's all, it's all there. It's all there. It's, it's all there. And I don't know how many pages of footnotes if you want to go, if, or endnotes if you want to go look at them. But you just tell the story and you find yourself, you find yourself fascinated also by, yeah, the, the sort of trying to understand someone occasionally you have to sort of, you, you, you find these really strange things for, or interesting things about Truman, Truman. Truman did not know Roosevelt at all. And he, and he would occasionally privately disparage him in his, in his diary, even before he became vice president. But later on, he, he would later on remember things with talking to Roosevelt about history. They never had these conversations. Truman would make up these things about himself, which I found really interesting. So what do you, what does it tell me? Well, it tells me that Truman really, really, really wanted Roosevelt's approval. And if he didn't get it, he made it up for himself. And you forgive him for that because every, we all do that a little bit. So that was, so, and, and so and that's, that maybe that was a novelist thing, but again, it wasn't cheating. I was using what was, what was in front of me. 
<laughs> just a point of interest. And when you say he's like all of us, that's what I like. And that's where you get ordinary man from to hit that again. in your sub headline is it is something we would all do. And also, I, I think it wasn't just self-serving. That's something important for people to hear. Nobody wanted to hear that the new president had Oh no! I, I really spent one meeting and five minutes with the with the guy that you revered and has led the nation to victory and through the Great Depression for twelve years. You want to think of them as being buddies and and uh, being at least at least a working partnership of some time. So in a way, maybe we we forgive him for that because it also eases that transition. Yes, and he and he always referred in speeches to Roosevelt carrying on his great work and and you know and and finish ending the war. I mean, his first speech to Congress. Uh, has referred to Roosevelt, we must end, you know, to end the war in Europe, and then, and then, and then, of course, the war in Japan, the war in the the war in the Pacific, which, uh, which, which, which took, which came, which came, the war, in, the war in Europe ended in in May, the war in in the Pacific ended in August. In preparation for our conversation, I emailed Sally Mott Freeman, who I interviewed about her book, The Jersey Brothers, a missing naval officer in the Pacific, and his family quest to bring him home. And she was kind enough to submit a video question for you today. So let me roll that for everybody at home and then you can dive into it and answer it. Great. Question for Jeffrey Frank. First of all, congratulations on such an incisive and fresh account of our 33rd president. Really wonderful story. I was especially taken in by your coverage of our entry into the Korean War, its tortured lifespan, freighted conclusion, an unfortunate legacy that lingers to this day not least due to General MacArthur. So my question pertains to General MacArthur and his Korea tenure. Why do you think he was so slow to react to the North's initial attack of the South, given his hauntingly similar, humiliating career antecedent in the Philippines in 1941? In that case, of course, he failed to respond to an order from Washington to get his planes in the air and his air defenses were bombed on the ground, wingtip to wingtip within 24 hours. That began a disastrous cascade that doomed America's defense of the Philippines and resulted in his humiliating loss of command there. That chain of events is so strikingly similar to his early missteps in Korea. Your reconstruction of events was outstanding. You used first person accounts, beginning with misgivings from by John Foster Dulles, by Dwight Eisenhower, including a recounting Sunday morning, June 25th, MacArthur was notified of North Korea's surprise attack, but waited three days. He waited until Tuesday, June 27th, to respond to the situation seriously. Seoul fell the very next day. How could this have happened twice? Was it that MacArthur was insulated by the same calcified, psychophantic staff that had served him in both conflicts? Could his inexorable self-promotion during those both those conflicts have intimidated not one but two U.S. presidents and their top brass in Washington? Was it that both FDR and Harry Truman, both Democrats, worried that MacArthur, a media revered Republican, had aspirations to unseat them? I'm really curious and interested to hear your response. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to ask the question. Well, I don't, that was a great question, and, and I must say, you answered you answered a lot of it in the question. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you you referred. I think Eisenhower at one point in his diary, I can't quote exactly, but basically he wrote, "How could such an idiot have become 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 a big, 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 risen so high as a, as a general?" And MacArthur, uh, Eisenhower had served with MacArthur in the Philippines when he was a, I guess, a lieutenant colonel. I can't remember what his rank was, but he but he he had. A, a, MacArthur was, yeah, MacArthur did not spend one single night in Korea during the entire course of the war. He would be, would be, he'd, he'd be back at his, back at his, in, in his, in his very fancy place in, 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 in Tokyo. He was, he, I don't want to be ageist, but he was an old man too. He was very, very slow to react. Everyone noticed that and worried about it. Um, he was, um, and he was, and he basically had no, uh, he, at first he thought, oh, this is just another border incident. He simply had no, yes, Seoul had actually fallen before he sort of began to pay attention. It was, it, it was a very, very, he was totally ill-suited for the job. And, uh, and, and, uh, and before, before very long, the, 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 the North had basically, had basically was in control of 90% of South Korea. This, they basically launched a blitzkrieg in the yes, in, in end of June, July. And, um, and then MacArthur had one brilliant military move left in him, and this was the, the there was a landing at Incheon, 
which was uh, about 30, 40 miles from 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 Seoul, and and it was a, it was a surprise landing, and 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 the the Allies, the Americans, and the and, and the Allied forces that came in, and they basically pushed the North back. In a way, the war was turned around in, in, at that moment. And then what happened was, after that, this MacArthur took seemed to think, well, we could we can now. We could now do what the what the North thought they could do by we could unify Korea under our auspices. I could, I started thinking about this and I compared this in a way to our policy in Iraq. The first call for was to push the Kuwaitis, push the Iraqis out of Kuwait. George George H. 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 It was a very successful war. We, we had everyone behind us, or all the Allies behind it. The 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 Iraqis were pushed out of Kuwait, and the war was over. Then Gulf War Two became what we all know, the Iraq war that, and for all, with all of its consequences for the Mideast and the rest of the world. And you can, and that's what Korea turned into. Korea turned in, could have been Gulf War I after Incheon, it turned into Gulf War II with, with, with all that happened. And, 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 and then Truman basically lost control of his war. And so, and so for that matter, did the Joint Chiefs, even General Marshall basically deferred. MacArthur was a personage that people deferred to. He was a he was a, a legend in his own mind, but also in his own time. And there was no getting around it. And so so when Truman finally realized through various acts of insubordination from MacArthur that he had to be fired, it, be, it was a, it became a major event. Truman Truman uh, tr people began Senator McCarthy said this the son of a bitch should be impeached. And then and, and Truman was smart enough to know that these things don't last. And then MacArthur came back. I, 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 I could tell the whole story. MacArthur then, his, his allies in Congress said, come back and give a speech, which he did. It became a speech that, a very famous big speech he televised to the whole country, which ended with the words, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. People were weeping. One congressman said, I heard the voice of God in the flesh today. It was an enormously effective speech. People compared it to Churchill. But within about a month, there were hearings about hearings from Congress. And MacArthur went on tour and the crowds got smaller and smaller and he's kind of faded away. And he ended up, he ended up living in the Waldorf Astoria, uh, taking a corporate job and then, he, and then kind of, and then kind of vanishing. And Truman, and, and people realized this was a question of, of, of civilian control of the army. He was, Truman was the commander in chief, not MacArthur. And he was going to stay in that job as far as the longevity. He he was in the public eye. He could command the public eye, whereas somebody like Admiral Dewey, not the Thomas Dewey that Truman beats for re-election famously, but Admiral Dewey comes back from the Spanish-American War and people are saying president. They're seeing a president in him. They're cheering him. And then it's hard to keep that, especially as the Korean War is still going on. So it's hard to keep that before the public eye. I wanted to touch on the decision to drop those two atomic bombs, which, by the way, one of the Jersey brothers in, sorry, Mott Freeman's title is the man who briefs the president, President Truman, on the atomic bomb and tells him the truth. MacArthur's painting a very rosy scenario about a land invasion of Japan, which he's pining for. And uh, it's him who, who explains to him that what the bombs can do. And, and that that's part of that book, The Jersey Brothers. Another reason I recommend it. Dropping those bombs, however, it's still as debated today as it was back when we first got that news from the president himself. He goes and tells the nation that these bombs have been dropped. In the trials of Harry S. Truman, you talk about that, you explain the real mechanics of it, that it's not a president or it's not Harry S. Truman just there with a button and he could just hit it and, and the bombs fly. What practical realities went into making that decision that generations will always second guess and not not really understand or not really know because we can't possibly know what his first person beliefs experience and desire was in dropping those bombs yeah I, yeah i mean well before truman became president um the what when roosevelt was president the so-called interim committee made the decision are we going to use this thing and they said yeah there was no dissent whatsoever um, and then, um, and then the what the, the target when Truman was briefed on the bomb, he, he he was very much he was really excited about it. He was told about it. That he was told about the first successful test while he was in Potsdam, and um, and the, the, the test in the called the Trinity test in New Mexico in July sixteenth, nineteen forty five. He told Churchill they were, someone said they were like two boys with with walking around with apples in their pocket, they were so happy. And but Truman could then see, yeah, the war, the war could the war now could probably end quickly if this thing was going to work and it was going to work. Um, the, the target committee, meanwhile, had met and they had chosen Kyoto, 
as the first target, um, the first where the first bomb should be dropped, and it was seen as a really effective place to, to hit Japan because because it would completely demoralize them. But others began to say this is not such a great idea. Uh, Secretary of War Simpson said this. You know, Kyoto is a city of shrines and art and 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 uh, and, and and the emperor's residence for a thousand years. Don't do it. They'll never never forgive us. So 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 that so that, that went off the off the list and and Hiroshima became the number one target and, and so people say that was Truman's big decision was to drop the bomb no Truman the big decision was not to drop the bomb on Kyoto this was pretty well set in stone by now the idea that a president who had been president for three months or well three months could it, during a war could not do whatever he could do to save American lives it was preposterous there was no choice there was no going back. And Truman did what any president would do and what he had to do. And they went ahead. The second bomb on, Hiro on, on Nagasaki, not clear. Not clear who even gave the order for that bomb. But, but, it would, but that was probably all set in motion by then. So, um, and the war, the war did end pretty quickly after, after, the, war on, after the bomb on, dropped on Nagasaki, the war ended within days. I mean, every Japan surrendered within days. Also that foreigners in Japan, they were, they were prepared to kill them and let the United States know that's what they were going to do. And I, I interviewed a young lady about a book. It's called Journey Interrupted. And she happened to be a German citizen. She ends up stuck in Japan. Her father's anti-Nazi. They're really people without a country. And she says, when they heard the emperor, heard him give that speech, she said, I was so happy. She's out just at uh, the way she tells it. it. It sounds like a little tiki bar kind of things from Japan. And she can't show how thrilled she is that they have surrendered and that she's not going to be killed and none of her whole family be wiped out. So there are many concerns with that. And I think when you read a book like The Trials of Harry S. Truman, you put yourself in that moment. You realize our answers are not always as, as simple when we have to make them. So I, I really enjoy that about this book. There's so much in it, but I want to wrap up the interview, ask people to go buy the book, get all of those other things that are indeed in it. Truman is frozen in the American mind, holding aloft that newspaper, Dewey beats Truman, ultimate underdog win, an amazing moment. And that election is really a validation of him as, as a man, as a leader, because that didn't happen. Today, we, we assume a, pres a vice president who comes into office tragically is going to get elected in his own right. It didn't necessarily happen. Well, it didn't happen for most of it. It didn't happen in the 1800s, certainly, until Theodore Roosevelt's the first one to, to be elected. So that that's a shining moment. And I think since we're all we all feel a little bit like we're ordinary people and like we're underdogs, why do you think readers or why do you tell readers, hey, pick up this book because we're all ordinary compared to somebody who's president of the United States. We're all everyday citizens and people. Why should they pick up the trials of Harry S. Truman to see what he went through in those trials and how maybe when we're called upon in whatever our endeavor is, we can rise to that occasion too. and We could do our very best to come to a positive outcome and be a, a better force for the world to deliver for our fellow man. Yeah, I think another reason, though, I think going back to that period, there's something really great about I mean, Truman himself was a man. He loved the Constitution. He loved this country. And I think and, and in a way, it was a more more innocent time. Politics was more, I won't say it's more innocent, but but it was it was far less partisan. There was a lot of there was a lot of cooperation. Truman ran in 1948. Truman ran against the do nothing Congress, but it was not a do nothing Congress. The Congress had passed the Marshall Plan. This Congress had passed the Atomic Energy Act with Republicans. Uh, people like people like Senator Vandenberg, who was who was instrumental in, in getting the Marshall Plan passed. Uh, people like even like Congressman Richard Nixon, who was who who, who went to visit uh, Europe in, in, a, in a congressional task force and saw what how much destruction there was and realize how much needed to be done to rebuild. So it was a different, so it's a wonderful thing to, to just to revisit that era and be reminded of what, what we were and what we could do and what we still can do. I mean, we were able to do these things very quickly. We were able to, to pass these programs, get things done with extraordinary speed. And that's something that, that's something that's really valuable to, to go back to. So that's maybe that's, maybe that's another reason to, to read, to read the, uh, the, the, the book. I have, I'm not selling it. I, I it become something of a, a time traveler. I became something of a time traveler while I was writing. I loved living in that period and sort of ignoring what was going on in the country today. <laughs> 
Well, you don't have to sell the book, Jeffrey Frank, because I will do it. I will happily recommend it to everybody. Truman is a fascinating president. If you go to his library, uh, for my part, I've been to many, many presidential libraries. I've gone to that one twice, and I live nowhere near Missouri. But I found myself saying, there should be more of this. There should be more of that. I want more uh, Harry S. Truman, just because he's a, a fascinating figure. He's a, a is indeed an ordinary man, as it says here in the trials of Harry S. Truman, the extraordinary presidency of an ordinary man. Please do pick up the book. Thank you so much, Jeffrey Frank, for giving us this fresh perspective on his nearly two terms in office. We're still dealing with NATO. We're still dealing with the Korean situation over there. So this is a book to pick up if you want to know how we got from there to here. I wish you the best of luck with this book. Do hope everyone will pick it up to see how this ordinary man met the Republic's greatest challenges. Dean, thank you so much. I, was, I, really, enjoyed, I really enjoyed this. Again, the book is... The Trials of Harry S. Truman, The Extraordinary Presidency of an Ordinary Man, 1945 to 1953. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. By buying a book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My sincere thanks to Jeffrey Frank for joining us and sharing a unique portrait of the 33rd president of the United States. Here's a guy who rose to the occasion when fate called his number. Visit our guest at jeffreyfrank.com or on Facebook and at Jeffrey A. Frank on Twitter. If you enjoyed watching this conversation, please do subscribe to our YouTube and Rumble channels for future journeys in the Wayback Machine. And you can visit me at historyauthor.com. From there, you can find all my social media accounts as well as over 250 interviews with authors you're sure to enjoy. And there's none you'll enjoy more than Sally Mott Freeman. I really am proud to have Sally's support and friendship ever since we first interviewed about her book. You don't want to miss that. It's an absolutely amazing tale. It's a book like no other, and I don't say that lightly. It's called The Jersey Brothers, a missing naval officer in the Pacific and his family's quest to bring him home. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you enjoyed this journey into yesterday. Until that next trip into the past together, on behalf of Jeffrey Frank, thanks so much for time traveling with us today and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.